Wednesday, China issued its latest national defense white paper, the first since President Xi Jinping launched major military reforms in 2015. The document sets out China's defense policy and highlights the diverse and complex security threats facing China at a time when some Western countries are disregarding China's contribution to global peace and development. But just what are the threats facing China and what exactly is China's role in maintaining international security? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. Join Joining me for the discussion from Washington, D.C. is Michael O'Hanlon, a senior fellow and director of research for the Pouring foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution. From London, Alexander Nekrasov, a former Kremlin advisor, and in our Beijing studio, Yeo Dong Xiao, associate professor at China's National Defense University of the People's Liberation Army. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Now, um, China issued its first ever defense-related white paper back in 1995, and this is the 10th white paper on national defense China has issued. Uh, Mr. Yu, could you please give us the context of exactly what is the re purpose of the release of such white paper and who are involved in drafting such a report? Um, is it a similar common practice among different countries? Uh, yes, uh, just as you mentioned, uh, this is the 10th national defense uh, white paper issued by the Chinese government. The main purpose is try to uh, brief the China's assessment of the national security environment, the defense, uh, defensive defense policy of China, and the uh, reform in the China's defense sector and also military, and the China's contribution to the world peace and stability. The sole purpose for launching or issuing these defense uh, Net policy white paper is to try to uh, make China's defense policy more pa transparent, to enhance the understanding of China's defense policy, and uh, uh, improve the mutual understanding and uh, confidence. Mm -hmm. Well, this was the the tenth such paper. Um, however, it was the it is the first such paper that was issued in 2015. Meaning, it took four years to come up with this latest one, whereas the ones uh, before this one uh, came out every two years. Exactly w how to explain this bigger gap between this one and the previous version of, of such a white paper, Mr. Yu? Uh, it's true that uh, uh, in the previous uh, nine white paper, it issued roughly every two years, but uh, it, uh, two, it takes uh, four years for us to uh, issue the latest, uh, the tenth white paper. I think the main reason is that, as you know, China is undergoing the largest reform in defense sector and in military, uh, which is roughly divided into three phases. Uh, the first phase is the reform of a uh, leadership and the command system. The second phase is the reform of a force structure. These two phases are basically completed. And uh, now is uh, undergoing the, the last phase, the third phase, that is the reform of uh, policies, rules, and institutions. So uh, I think uh, this uh, phase is roughly expected to finish next year, 2020. So it's the time for us to issue our new uh, white paper. Mm. What, before I go on to our foreign guests, what are the central messages or the most important message in your eyes that's being sent through this white paper? It, it give out the fundamental objective of China's military, for instance, it give out China's principle and the way how we achieve a modern army. But uh, what is new and what is not? I think the core message of this paper is that uh, 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 now China is undergoing a major military, largest military reform since the founding of People's Republic of China in 1949. And the Chinese military capacity uh, and the military power increased dramatically. Uh, but China still stick to the peaceful development road. And the Chinese defense policy remain as defensive in nature. China never seeks hegemonism and never seek the uh, fear of influence. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there is even one more, China never sees expansionism expansion policy either. either. So let me go to uh, Michael in Washington, D.C. Uh, what is your perception of uh, this white paper? Do you think the key message ha messages, as outlined by Mr. Yeo, have been read uh, clearly by our friends in, in the United States? Well, greetings and thanks for having me on. Thank I you. think that as a military analyst, if I can just try to imagine myself not being American, not being a Westerner, just looking at this from a pure defense point of view, a lot of what China is doing makes sense. Uh, many of the points that Mr. Yeo made about streamlining the military, focusing more on high technology, focusing more, uh, frankly, on power projection, despite what you just said about no hegemonic or expansionary ambitions. Nonetheless, from a defense and strategy point of view, these are the sorts of things that you would expect a rapidly modernizing country with uh, roughly 200 billion a year in military resources able to devote to defense modernization. So that's one category of my response. But as an American foreign policy analyst, I can uh, underscore that as you well know, there are many Americans who see this kind of rapid improvement in China's military capabilities combined with certain Chinese ideas like the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea and get very worried that China, in fact, is still saying that it believes in peaceful development, but in fact is developing expansionary ambitions, not because China is an evil country, but just because big powers behave this way historically. And when we see the combination of President Xi uh, reasserting his own control over Chinese politics, the Chinese military budget going up, this kind of a Chinese defense white paper, and then the claims on the South China Sea, many of the islands within, and so forth, many American foreign policy commentators get worried that China is developing the kind of hegemonic ambitions that great powers in Europe, let's say, used to have in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries. So that's the second category of mm -hmm. my response, which is a little bit more concerned than the first category. I see, I see. Um, Mr. Yu, would you like to already to respond at least to some of the key points that uh, uh, Michael just uh, highlighted just now? For instance, uh, um, that uh, China is spending a lot of money on the military. We're going to take a close a look at the kind of uh, military expenditure China has been putting on building its national defense. Mr. Yeo, what is your first Im uh, response here? Uh, my response that uh, just uh, uh, our American friend mentioned, uh, yes, there's a strong uh, strategic suspicion against China's quick rise uh, in the overall national strength. Not not China today is not only the second largest economy in the world, but also its political influence uh, in the world, its military uh, power production capacity capability also increased uh, very quickly. So this uh, uh, caused some worry uh, in a Western country, in the United States. It's, uh, I think it's a very nature. And that is also the key purpose for this white paper. Uh, maybe uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not easy or impossible for us to use uh, one white paper to persuade our Western friends to understand China has no such kind of hegemonic ambition. But anyhow, we try to demonstrate or to, to recommit our commitment to peace for development. And for the South China Sea, uh, we believe that uh, China has the sovereign, sovereign, uh, uh, sovereignty over those islands in South China Sea and also is uh, the legitimate rights for China to take all the uh, necessary measures to safeguard our national uh, territory integrity and sovereignty over those islands. So, uh, uh, basically, basically it's, it's said within this paper that uh, um, the, the situation in the South China Sea is actually quite stable. The countries that are in the region uh, have this kind of mechanism to discuss, to consult with China about any possible fluctuation in the security situation, and the situation is not worrisome to countries in the region. So, um, Mr. Yeo, do you understand the kind of concern that uh, countries outside the region, for instance, the United States, States has been expre expressing um, regardless of the fact that people, countries in the region are taking care of the situation. 
Uh, I believe that uh, uh, the South China Sea uh, is a very important sea area in the region, and I also agree that it's a very important uh, sea link, uh, link of a communication uh, slug. Uh, but I don't think there's any challenge or threats to the safety of slug in the region. There's no uh, threats to the freedom of navigation. The problem is some countries, some maritime powers, they sent warships to this uh, sea area. That actually posed the military threat to the regional uh, peace and stability. And that forced China to take some react reactive measures to protect our uh, rights and the security in the region. Okay. Well, I'm going to give Michael um, maybe a, a chance to react to what we just said, but let's really not dwell on this issue because we can take a few hours to discuss the South China Sea issue. We'll ne not get out of it. And I want to get, our, uh, get to our friend uh, Alex, who's standing by in London. Michael, you want to react very quickly? Yes. Yeah, I'll be quick. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would say it's not quite as simple as to claim that the regional countries are all very happy about the situation. I know that the Vietnamese are not entirely happy, and of course there are Vietnamese-Chinese disagreements over a number of the islands. And the Philippines are in a very funny position because they brought a case about the Scarborough Shoal to the International a Permanent Court of Arbitration, and, uh, which ruled against China, as you know. Although, admittedly, there's a lot of ambiguity about the authority of that, uh, of that permanent court because the law of the sea is not ratified by the United States or many other countries. And so this is a nebulous area of international law. President Duterte in the Philippines has chosen to try to get along with China, which is probably a smart move. But nonetheless, there is a disagreement between the Philippines and China over certain of these islands. Hmm. But when the United States says we want freedom of navigation, that includes warships. And there are no reasons that um, U.S. Navy ships or any other country's Navy or merchant ships should be deprived access okay. to the sea lanes. So I'm afraid we have a disagreement there. We're going to have to work out as well. All right. Uh, let me go to our guest, Alex, uh, um, who is standing by, who has been standing by. Thank you very much. Alex, you want to jump in here and uh, give your thoughts on any of these topics we have been talking about so far? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that white papers on defense are published by different countries as a signal to their friends and foes. It's got nothing to do with internal policy because you don't need to tell your own military what you are doing. So it's a signal to the world. This is what we stand for. This is what we are planning. And we, you'd better take us into account because we are not going to allow our interests to be trampled on. And this is exactly what this white paper is about. And I think it's, a, it's the right time for China to reassert its position in the world. It's a mighty power now. And it shouldn't be on the defensive when it comes to protecting its interests. And I think it was quite right to mention in the paper uh, and in the briefing after it was published uh, that uh, such uh, internal threats like the Hong Kong riots which were, by the way, covered by the Western media in a disgraceful, provocative way, and uh, also some other internal problems. Th th this is very important for the world to know that China is aware of it, and China is going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Now, the disappointing bit about this, news, uh, this, this latest white paper is that China and the Chinese leadership seem to uh, not understand one important point. The NATO alliance, and I stress the word alliance, is getting more aggressive. It is now operating outside its remit area. It is spreading its uh, uh, activities way beyond the borders where it should have been operating. Now, China insists that uh, Russia is a partner, not an ally, not an alliance with uh, uh, with Russia. Yeah. This is a big mistake. Okay. Because if China wants to stand up to the NATO alliance, it has to be in alliance, not partnership All right, with I, Russia. Okay. That is a key point of this whole period. 
Alex, I, th I think I can, I can even address the, the last point that you made. I think China's position on any alliance, especially military alliance, is very clear and it has been consistent that China is not going into any uh, alliance, especially military alliance that targets any third party. Um, I think the reason has been very clear and it has been one of the fundamental pillars of China's foreign policy, right, which is uh, non-alliance and uh, non, um, especially not targeting any third country, non-confrontational, let's say. Leave, let people decide their own affairs and uh, um, uh, you know China would like to play a constructive role instead of to gang up with anybody to target anybody else but you mentioned a very important point which is about threats and I want to ask Mr. Yeo for instance uh, Michael just now also mentioned the kind of military spending that is worrying what kind of security threats are China facing at this moment has it been the same situation as maybe 20 years ago or even five years ago or has the situation become more complex which warrant greater national uh, defense expenditure? Uh, I think the white paper very clearly uh, uh, explain the security environment China is facing today and uh, compared to the past uh, for example five or four years ago when China issued the last white paper in 2015 uh, the security situation, uh, in my view, basically remain the same. Uh, for example, uh, just as White Paper clearly point out, peace, development, and women cooperation remain the irresistible trend in today's world. Uh, of, uh, especially the Asia Pacific region, where China is located, the security situation remain basically uh, stable. But I also believe today's uh, security environment of China become more complicated than before. Uh, there are some examples. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean by, being, by the security situation being stable but it's becoming more complicated? Exactly. Uh, uh, what I mean is that the general situation is uh, still remains stable. There are no uh, major military uh, threats to China national security. There are no uh, very high possibility of a large scale military uh, conflict between China and uh, other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but I cannot rule out those uh, uh, possibly a small scale um, conflict between China and some uh, countries, for instance, in South China Sea or some in some other areas. So that is why I say there the security situation, uh, although basically remains stable, but uh, there are still a uh, lot of uh, complicated factors. Uh, just now, uh, our American friends mentioned about uh, uh, the freedom of navigation. Uh, I just want to uh, South China Sea. I don't want to highlight three points. One is that uh, the disputes in South China Sea between China and other some. Uh, uh, South China, uh, South Asia claimants is not a new one. It for many years, but uh, just because Americans' new policy of uh, re rebalancing policy and uh, the returning to Asia Pacific in 2010, this issue become more hot. Second point, uh, uh, China. I don't want to re uh, reiterate China's position on the so-called arbitration uh, case uh, issue uh, between China and uh, the Philippines. Uh, we believe it is illegal and we will not recognize its uh, legality of the ruling. Yes. The third point is that we, we there's no any threat to the freedom of navigation of any country, including both civilian commercial ships and warships in the South China Sea. I'm uh, just wondering why Americans want to enjoy the freedom of navigation close to those small islands. Why there's a so vast sea area, American, there's no anyone prevent or hamper Americans right. enjoy the freedom. Okay. Um, let's not continue on the South China okay. Sea because this is really about the National Defense White Paper and there is a lot more about this paper. But I do want to ask you this question, uh, Mr. Yu and Michael and uh, Alex, if you want to jump in, um, uh, please go ahead. I do want to ask you this question. So China's military spending has been going up, although the percentage of China's military spending has been at a very stable level as to the GDP, right, around 1.26% uh, 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 in 2017, well below 2% for the past three decades. So how do you explain the continuous growth of China's uh, military expenditure if the, if the overall security situation has been stable? Uh, uh, one, two reasons. One is uh, I have mentioned uh, Although the basic uh, security situation remains stable, but we do face 
uh, more security challenges. Uh, I just give uh, two examples. One uh, is uh, the increase of China's uh, out outgoing investment, and more and more Chinese go abroad to do business to study. So China's overseas interests are on the rise, and these overseas interests face more uh, challenges because of the turbulent regional security situation. For example, in the Middle East, uh, uh, for example, in Libya and uh, in Yemen, and uh, so that it requires China to provide more security coverage or protection for China's overseas interests. And also China take more responsibility to provide more uh, uh, public goods to the internet community as the one of the P5. Mm -hmm. And the second, the situation in Taiwan. Uh, in 2015, when we issued the, last, the previous the white paper, at that time, um, Mr. Ma ying was the, the leader of the Taiwan uh, Authority. The KMT was the ruling government, a ruling pa party. But now, today, after the Chai Ing-wen uh, led the DPP, uh, came to power in 2016, the cross-street relation uh, remained tense and uh, the cross-street uh, uh, relation uh, in great difficulty. So that is uh, the new challenges to our national security. Mm -hmm. So Michael, um, do you think these, these security threats are understood or perceived by uh, the, the uh, military um, analysts or, or relevant scholars who are studying these views? Do you think they are, there is a fair understanding of the kind of complex security threats that China is faced with? I think so. You probably took note a couple of weeks ago of a letter that Michael Swain of the Carnegie Endowment and others organized that probably several dozen American foreign policy experts signed and they were very concerned about the growing uh, tone of much American discourse that sounded almost echoing the Cold War in regard to China. And, and they were trying to say that, you know, while we have real concerns about Chinese foreign policy and Chinese domestic policy, nonetheless, the signers of that letter did not think we should interpret the current moment as anything similar to the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And I agree with them. And I do worry that we might slightly overdo it in the United States. You know, even in the United States, we, we tend to assess that China's military budget is a little bit larger than you said, but even our estimates are still less than 2% of GDP. Mm. And you've got three different countries represented on your panel today. My Russian friend and I, we are, we're each from countries that spend more than 3% of our GDP on our militaries. And so in that regard, the Chinese uh, defense budget or military budget is not that un unusually large. Uh, but it's grown so fast because the Chinese economy has grown so fast mm -hmm. that nonetheless there is this growing sense of worry. And the last point I'll make, Mr. Yeo, I think very correctly pointed out the way China views its growing overseas interests and the need to protect them militarily because now it has the potential and the capability to protect them. China had overseas interests before, but it had no means of protecting right. them. So it had to hope that those interests would be stable or protected by the United States. Any country is going to prefer to have some capability to protect its own interests. So it's natural that as China becomes more capable of protecting its own overseas interests, it will want to do so. But I think Americans look and say, listen, the whole international order has worked pretty well for China. They've grown economically largely because of this order that the United States has protected. And so we would like to see a little bit more cooperation from China on issues like handling the South China Sea. The nine dash line really concerns us. That's a relatively new development in Chinese foreign policy to place such emphasis on that nine dash line. And All that's right. one of the reasons why American strategists are concerned. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Alex, what is your take? Um, I mean, Russia is, se seems to be out of the picture for the moment, but uh, uh, nevertheless, Russia is a very important partner to China, and China considers Russia's role extremely important. What kind of security challenges do you think the two countries share uh, in, in today's world? Well, first of all, the biggest one currently is the information war which is waged by the West against China and Russia and other countries and this war is becoming more and more aggressive and unfortunately China and Russia does not do not have the coordinated policy in resisting that war now look at the at the way for example developments around around Iran now this basically what we're seeing now is that both uh, all the Western countries 
are presenting the whole case in a way that Iran is causing the problems in the Persian Gulf, that Iran is a danger to the oil routes, and so on and so on, which is, the, which is not true at all. The Americans have started this process by pulling out of the nuclear agreement. The British have continued these provocations with seizing an Iranian ship. But the Russian and Chinese media are not that aggressive in defending Iran and defending their position on Iran. And I didn't see the Russian and Chinese media uh, have a, you know, take a good, good hit at the Western media for Hong Kong, for example, or Ukraine, where the situation is so dire that uh, basically a big, new, a big war can happen in Europe. Now, this information war is a very serious, this information aggression, I would call it, is a very serious security threat. And this has to be tackled very seriously. There has to be a united position of China and Russia on this threat. They have to have some sort of coordination in how do they respond and how they tackle mm -hmm. all this international issue. And then there's another one, okay. a cultural threat. Now, we know a lot about Chinese students going to the West to study. Mm. Now, there's obviously a beneficial side to it, but there's a very damaging side to it when they become influenced by the liberal uh, ideology of the West. The same the Russian students as well. Okay. This has to be tackled as well. All right. Um, I, I get your point, Alex, and I think there is uh, uh, some element of truth in there, but I do want to concentrate on the information war, or the information war that you mentioned. Um, by the way, we here on this program, we talked very aggressively or very intensively about the Hong Kong issue, trying to bring the other side of the picture to our international audience. Nevertheless, I do think there is a, a information imbalance between uh, China or between Russia versus the West, which is very much powerful in having a say on international affairs or how international affairs are perceived by international audiences. So, Mr. Yeo, how do you look at this issue of this information war that could be waged at this moment by the West against China and Russia? Uh, yes, I, I just, uh, uh, as our, our Russian friends, uh, many, I totally agreed with him that uh, now there's a, a strong uh, influence balance, information balance and uh, between China, uh, Russia, and the Western countries, uh, for the example, information imbalance, uh, imbalance, information imbalance, mm -hmm. and there is uh, information warfare against China uh, in, in, in uh, many uh, issues. For example, Hong Kong issue and uh, some other issues. Uh, uh, I just give you one example. I come from the International College of uh, uh, Defense Studies of National Defense University. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, international fellows or uh, officers from all over the world. But before they come to China, what we, they know about China is from Western media. On the internet, there are English or French uh, language dominant uh, information. So what they know about China actually all are quite uh, negative. Mm -hmm. But when they come to China, when they contact with Chinese, uh, listen to our uh, professor's lectures, they can know, uh, have a more comprehensive or balanced yeah. view of China. So indeed, uh, one of the very important things highlighted in, on the, uh, in the white paper is the kind of international exchange right that is being uh, undertaken by Chinese military with their international counterpart Michael I want to go to you real fast maybe uh, try to limit it in 30 th 30 seconds uh, what is your reaction to this question that Alex mentioned about this information war information imbalance between China and Russia and uh, the Western countries and what kind of security uh, threat that poses to these two countries well, Alex had a lot in his comment, and uh, there are fundamentally different challenges, I believe, in regard to the U.S.-Russia relationship and the U.S.-China relationship. And I actually think the information uh, problem is much worse in the U.S.-Russia relationship. So personally, I don't lump them together. We do have issues with China. We have different political systems. We have important disagreements over economics and military strategy right now. But I don't think of this as being uh, fundamentally an information war. I think of it as a policy disagreement. Whereas with Russia, we know there is subterfuge, there is covert activity. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of, of elements that add to the intrigue, okay. that add to the confusion, All and right. that do perhaps deserve the name information war. But I, I don't use that expression in the U.S.-China relationship. All right. Uh, we are going to leave it there. Many thanks to my guests, Michael Hanlon in the United States, Alexander Nekrasov in London, and uh, Yo Dong.
shell here in Beijing. And that's it for this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. Uh, you have been um, watching a very um, special edition. I'll see you next week at the same time.